Uh, good afternoon. We are live on Radio BVM with Dennis Duffy. Uh, Dennis Duffy is an archivist at the Royal BC Museum and the author of Imagine Please, Early Radio Broadcasting in British Columbia, uh, which was published by the Provincial Archives uh, Almost 30 years ago. 30 years ago this summer. 30 years ago this summer. So we're so pleased to have Dennis uh, in the studio with us today, talking about the early history of broadcasting in the province. Um, but first of all, I, I wanted to ask you that the, the book, Imagine Please, is largely based on oral his history interviews with people involved in the radio industry. How, did, how was it that those interviews came to be recorded? Well, the, uh, the oral history program uh, of the... Provincial Archives got underway away in 1974, and it was one of the first attempts to bring together uh, oral history collections from around the province in one place. And it was kind of unusual for an archive. Archives are usually considered a place that accepts existing material, uh, whereas the archive staff in the oral history program went out and made recordings themselves, sought out uh, people who were pioneers in various industries and various places, and recorded them for posterity. Now in the case of Imagine Please, which was part of the Sound Heritage series, I should mention that now defunct series of 40 books about B BC in the through oral history. Uh, there was an opportunity for the archives to showcase recordings in the collection and also uh, if they saw a particular subject area that was underrepresented they could commission new interviews. And Imagine Please came about because a fellow named Emmanuel Rontz who was at SFU uh, as a student had gone out and uh, collected recordings about the early days of radio in Vancouver. And there was another collector named Tom Hood who had both recordings of early programs and recordings of er early radio people talking about their experiences. And there was uh, another collection in Ottawa, the Kenneth Bambrick collection, who had a fellow who traveled across Canada and interviewed early broadcasters. So we looked at what was already there, and uh, I was commissioned to do this book, and part of that was to go out and fill in the gaps in the record. In particular, I went into the interior and interviewed some, uh, some pioneers there, and uh, some some more Vancouver people. I would talk to one person and they'd say, well, who should I talk to next? Right. That sort of thing. And so, uh, uh, as it's happened with a lot of these projects, you, you discover that you catch people just in time. Uh, one of my favorite interviews is with John Avison, the uh, classical musician and, and uh, conductor who was on the CBC for years. And I interviewed him the year before he died. Right. So it was a, it was important to do that, and uh, and now the now the material is at the provincial archives, or as it is now the Royal BC Museum, and people can come in and listen to the original recordings as well. Yeah. Now you at the at the Royal BC Museum have all kinds of audio media. Um, can you tell us a bit about some of the different types of things that people recorded sound on? Well, of course, uh, dear to the heart of this exhibit, I'm sure, would be the 16-inch broadcast transcriptions. Uh, those are 16-inch uh, in diameter disks. Uh, uh, often uh, per services who provided programming, like, say, the Jack Benny show in syndicated form, would send them out on disk. And as you know, it's, it would be very difficult to turn a disk over on the air right. because you'd have dead air. So instead of sending you one disk with the program on each side, you get two discs, and the reverse side of the disc would be blank. Well, the stations were very smart, and they would cut their own programming on the other side of the disc. So what we have a lot of in the collection is discs and discs of things like the Jack Benny show or um, oh, some music series, uh, which we're not that interested in preserving because they're preserved elsewhere. But what's valuable is the local programming on the other side. You turn over your Jack Benny discs and you have a whole side of uh, CGOR radio commercials from the 1940s. Uh, it's funny because collectors are often more interested in the Jack Benny side. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we have all kinds of uh, audio media going back to the very beginning. The oldest recording in our collection is a recording of uh, Quag Youth songs that was recorded on Hope Island, which is a small island off the coast of Vancouver Island, in 1899 by an um, ethnographer named George Dorsey. Uh, 
And uh, I quite often trot those out. Uh, people are astounded that we have a recording that old. They're on, they're on brown wax cylinders, which we can't play, but we had a copy made from the original cylinders in Ottawa. And uh, in that particular media, the, uh, the noise from the surface of the recording is louder than the signal. So you hear this, shh, 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 and way in the background, there's somebody singing. <laughs> That's fabulous. Um, so uh, on the topic of, of, of radio, how did the earliest radio stations in BC get started? In, in ways totally different than people would imagine. The, people were in love with the idea of, of radio broadcasting, and it's almost like they used the flimsiest excuse to go, to go into it. Um, newspapers were frequently involved in early radio stations to get out the news and to promote their publications. Churches used broad broadcasting a lot. They would broadcast their religious services and reach out to a larger community, especially to uh, uh, rural par parishioners who perhaps couldn't make it to services uh, during on Sunday. Music stores uh, would use them to promote the sale of phonograph records. And I, I love this one in particular, radio and electronic stores who wanted to sell radios, but in order to sell radios, there had to be a radio station for people to listen to. And often they wouldn't have one, so the first radio station in a given community might be started by the radio store. Right. So what were some of the first stations then uh, in this area? Well, there was a really interesting competition in March 1922 between three newspapers, The Sun, The Province, and The World, who all went on the air in the same month. Uh, it's hilarious because if you read the newspaper coverage of these, each, each paper claims that its station is the first and the only broadcasting station, although if you read somebody else's paper, you'd quite easily see that there were other people around. The Vancouver Sun, station CJCE, seems to have been the first which went on the air in early March and it operated in conjunction with the Sprottshaw School of Commerce, which even in those days offered courses in wireless telegraphy and uh, basic training for radio operators. So the, um, the Sun provided the transmitter uh, and the Sprottshaw School provided the expertise and it gave people a chance to do practical work. Uh, the Vancouver Daily Province, uh, originally called Station FE, went on the air in March the 13th and it later became uh, a flagship station for Vancouver, CKCD, which operated until 1940, primarily as a news station. And uh, the third station was uh, on March 23rd. The Vancouver Daily World started CFYC, which was a very important early station. This one was in partnership with TransCanada RadioVox Limited, uh, which was one of those radio uh, outfits that wanted to sell, sell radios to, to listeners. That station had a, had a lot of firsts, and it changed hands quite a few times. Uh, after 1926, it was operated by the International Bible Students Association, which we now know as the Jehovah's Witnesses. And there was controversial content on some of the Bible student stations, which eventually led to them all being shut down in 1928 28, when the government refused to renew their licenses. And it was that controversy that led... Uh, eventually to regulation of the airwaves and to the creation of the CBC. Wow. Um, so are there any kind of noteworthy early broadcasts that, uh, that stand out in your mind? Well, of course, this is people claiming that this was the first or whatever, but uh, The Sun, on March the 22nd, 1922, broadcast two acts that were appearing locally at the Pantages Theatre. Uh, a Miss Emma Height sang the song Maytime, and this was billed by The Sun as the first artist, that Miss Height was the first artist in Canada to sing into the radiophone. Now at this distance, who, who can say? They said she was, so maybe she was. Um, possibly the first political radio broadcast in Canada on October the 21st, 1924, CFYC broadcast uh, Prime Minister Mackenzie King's speech from the Denman Arena. Uh, the, a young technician at CFYC named Milton Stark arranged the broadcast and they ran a, a line into the Denman Arena uh, with funding from the Liberal Party because they wanted to put Mackenzie King on the air. And that's, 
if not the, if not the first, certainly a very early incidence of, of uh, political broadcast. And that, um, that line into the Denman Arena was important because they played hockey there. And uh, later that same year, uh, oh, I should backtrack here, uh, but broadcasting of hockey games. The first was heard in Toronto uh, in, in February of 1923, the first uh, uh, hockey game on the radio. But the first such broadcast in BC happened, as I say, in 1924 at the Denman Arena. Once again, Milton Stark was involved, and uh, he found himself at the game and unprepared. Uh, couldn't really describe effectively what was happening in front of him, but uh, the province sun, re the province uh, sports reporter was there, and when Milton tried to use the press box, they shoot him out. Get away, kid! You bother me. But the uh, fellow named Patterson, who worked for the province, came out, and uh, Milton had the microphone tucked into his pocket so people wouldn't come up and ask him, "What's this?" So Patterson stood there and broadcast the hockey game into Milton's pocket. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, that was late in 1924. And uh, and what were some of the other stations then that were around around the province? You mentioned the the three started by the local newspapers. Right. What were some of the rest? Well, the there was a real watershed. Uh, the number of stations that were were, were started in the 20s. Uh, uh, getting into some that people will remember now. Um, CFDC started in Nanaimo in 1923. A fellow who. Uh, uh, had a garage and battery company in uh, in the Nanaimo, a fellow named Arthur Holstead, whose nickname was Sparks. Uh, he eventually he moved his operation to Vancouver, and he'd been running this radio thing on the side. Uh, moved moved the station to Vancouver, and uh, originally they were in the Belmont Hotel here, and then the Sparks Company garage on Seymour Street, and then eventually the Hotel Georgia. Uh, where they stayed till 1941, and by the end of 1927, it had changed its call sign to CKWX. Uh, CKFC was an important station, uh, as in terms of a station run by a church. It was the first congregational church, which was later renamed Central Presbyterian. A uh, Dr. A. E. Cook was involved, and they would broadcast church services, uh, inspirational talks, sacred music, and the like. And uh, that started in September of 24. They later moved to Chalmers United Church in 1929. And eventually, they became uh, more of a commercial station. But uh, they also had a shortwave repeater, so their signal could be carried great distances into the interior as well. CFXC in US Minster was started by Fred Hume of Hume and Rumble Limited a store that sold electrical appliances. They started the station to promote the sale of radios again, because there wasn't a station in New West. In 1926, uh, Hume sold the station and the license to the Chandler brothers, who moved it to Vancouver and changed the call sign to CJOR. Uh, Fred Hume would later become the mayor of New Westminster, incidentally. Uh, perhaps most significantly, CNRV, which was a flagship station of the Canadian National Railway Service, uh, Canadian National Railway Radio Service, pardon me. The Canadian National System had radio cars for the enjoyment of their passengers, but they needed, again, it was very early days, they needed something to play on those radios, so they created radio stations as well. It might have been easier just to put a record player <laughs> On the, radio, on, the, on the train, but uh, um, this, this whole network was created to provide programming for the radio cars, but of course everybody who was in the area could also pick it up. This network and its stations were taken over in 1933 by the Canadian Radio Broadcasting Commission, which in 1937 evolved into the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, I'm also very fond of a station from the late 20s uh, called CHLS, which was an example of what's called a phantom license. Uh, there were only so many transmitters and so many available frequencies to go around, and CHLS had a phantom license with CKCD, so CKCD would, would do their programming, which was primarily news, and they would sign off, and then a moment later, using the same frequency, the same transmitter, and the same studio, and the same microphone, another station would sign on and say, this is CHLS. And uh, uh, this was, uh, I think, not coincidentally, uh, CHLS ties in with the name Billy Hassel, who is an important figure I'll, I'll tell you more about later. But uh, this sort of phantom licensing issue was, uh, was 
really a, uh, an interesting situation at the time. Uh, the airwaves were allocated very tightly. In Vancouver, for instance, five stations shared one frequency, the 730 a 730 kilocycle frequency until the early 1930s. They would divide up the airtime and then sign an off, on and off at scheduled times throughout the day. And each station would have slightly different programming, but it was the same transmitter. And you, you wouldn't even have to move your, move your radio from where it was on the dial. And then there was two other stations that shared a second frequency. Finally, an international agreement struck in Havana reallocated the frequencies and limited the output of the stations so that each station would have a clear channel in its own area. But this meant that two of the Vancouver stations had to go off the air, and that's why CKCD and CHLS shut down in 1940. So what, what type of programming would these early stations have been playing? Well, news was a, a big thing, and from what I've heard, often just news read out of the newspaper. Somebody would go through the newspaper and drop, draw circles around the, the key paragraphs. Music was very big, uh, both live in the studio as well as um, remotes or pickups from local dance halls and clubs. They would just run a telephone line in there and a microphone and they'd be able to you know, feature the local dance bands. And the bands were glad to be heard, so it wasn't very expensive. It's not like they had to pay the talent. People were just dying to be on the air in those days. And there'd also be music programs that were based on music from commercial discs and transcription services. Sometimes a transcription service would put together an entire series of radio programs like light classical music, and you could just create the program from the disc as if the group was playing right in your studio. Sports was big, of course, like the early hockey broadcast. And there were a lot of, I guess what I'd call semi-improvised comedy variety shows where people would get on and uh, tell jokes and somebody would do a song uh, and they would just keep going. They'd be late night shows and they'd just keep going until they ran out of gas. Uh, one that was uh, very prominent in Vancouver because of its network connection on the station CNRV, the CNR radio station, there was a program uh, called the the Four Continental Porters, and they would be they were supposed to be uh, continental rail, uh, continental train uh, porters, black porters. Of course, none of them actually were black, uh, but there is a famous uh, publicity photo of them in blackface. So it was a blackface program on the radio. It's very Amos and Andy. <laughs> and drama became uh, a, a, very, a, really st a real staple of, uh, of early radio, too. Yeah, one thing that we, uh, that we found interesting doing the research was that even though radio is an audio medium, you see people very dressed up for their performances or uh, ventriloquism. Mm -hmm. and, and it just seems so odd now to think of the appeal of ventriloquism. One of the most the popular air. programs uh, on American radio was um, uh, Edgar Bergen, uh, Candace Bergen's father, uh, who was a ventriloquist and had Charlie McCarthy and Mortimer Snurd. Why he even bothered to bring the dummies to the studio? How would they? How would anybody know if they were there? <laughs> Um, and uh, what about um, advertising? Was there much much advertising in the early days? There was a lot of resistance to advertising originally because people had this idea that radio had a noble mission and that somehow the, the, uh, the purity of radio as a noble experiment would, experiment would be diminished by grubby commerce. And it's hard to imagine now the sort of uh, ideal, idealistic view that they had. I've got an example here from a, a co comments from the Reverend A.D. McKinnon, a Presbyterian mission ser, ser, uh, superintendent in the Caribou, writing about radio in the province in 1922. It is a safe forecast if this wireless communication of important news, worthwhile concerts, thought-provoking addresses, inspiring operas, and ennobling and uplifting sermons can be supplied to dwellers in the remote plains and interior belts of British Columbia, that people can be numbered in the hundreds of thousands in a few years, where we now find only a few hundreds. The world is on the eve of great advances which portend the end of discontent and the ushering in of a longer 
and brighter day of peace. Uh, so obviously, people who had those kind of uh, idealistic sentiments didn't want uh, advertising. But advertising was inevitable. Um, first, just to support the costs of the station. And then people came to understand clearly that, hey, you could actually make money doing this. And they started with low rates, and then the rates would climb as, as the market dictated. There were a lot of restrictions on advertising. And uh, uh, one of the ones that I thought was very interesting is that you could, I think they were going for like a public broadcasting model where, you know, this program was brought to you by so-and-so and eventually you could say this, they produce a product of really high quality and the price is just superb, but you couldn't say what the price was because that would be crossing a line. Uh, and that kind of advertising, uh, Sometimes there was money, sometimes it was in the form of barter. There was a system called Contra where you would pay for your advertising through goods and sometimes that would be groceries to feed the junior announcers or it would be a car uh, for the station to use in its remote work. And, uh, and sometimes the pickings were, were very slim. I've got a story here, if I can find it. Yes, about an, this was in the 30s when times were rough. Uh, Barney Potts tells the story of, uh, of an early program. One of the early shows I remember was in Purdy's Restaurant, across from the Capitol Theater. It was for CKMO, and it was called Cinderella Slipper Time. The idea was a shoe store would donate the shoes, and they would, I guess, try them on people who were in the studio. And if they fit, the contestant would win the shoes. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of money in those days, he says. So were there uh, kind of were there s s radio celebrities locally? Were there kind of well-known personalities on the on the air? Well, a lot of people remember Earl Kelly, who was the newsreader on CKCD. Uh, certainly a, a, a figurehead. He was known as Mr. Good Evening because uh, at the end of every broadcast, he would wish a particular group of people a restful good evening, and you know all the ships at sea and. Uh, and uh, the, the, one of these uh, apocryphal stories, you don't know if it ever actually happened, that one night Earl Kelly wished all June brides a restful good evening. And somebody phoned into the station and said, uh, Mr. Kelly, what June bride wants a restful good evening? <laughs> uh, another fellow that was really well known uh, was Billy Brown, actually the best known local radio personality. He hosted the CKWX morning show, Billy Brown's Sunrise Club, and their afternoon show, Billy Brown's Brevities. And these were immensely popular programs. As the Sunrise Show, uh, you would send in a card to prove that you'd heard Billy Brown's show at 6.30 in the morning so you could be counted as a member of the Sunrise Club. And he'd send you a membership card. And the membership card that's reproduced in the book ha has the, the number 87,900. So either they started the numbering at 87,000 <laughs> or there were a lot of listeners. And uh, a fellow that worked with uh, Brown provides this uh, wonderful reminiscence of, of what his show was like. Billy Brown had a program from 2.30 to 3.30 every afternoon and it ran on radio in Vancouver for over 15 years. He had the largest single audience of any individual program, news or anything else. He was in a class by himself. His forte was British music through recordings of the British artists of the time. The program was called Billy Brown's Brevities. This should be recalled because it's going to be lost unless someone remembers it. Here's a man who sat in a little studio and turned out all the lights except one light directly above his script. He would sit there and he would have his head down resting on his hands and he'd be reading these poems and interesting stories. He had his music selected and we would have special records ready to play after a certain poem or story that he would read. Sometimes he would have his music in the background and he would ask for it to be raised or lowered at certain stages of the reading. He would read homey stories, philosophy, and poems bringing out the good deeds of life. The writer Edgar Guest was very popular on his program and a number of other people. Billy Brown himself was a veteran of the First World War and during World War II he brought out a lot of wartime nostalgia. Uh, 
He featured Great Britain and the boys over there. That was his great feature, along with the poems. It was our most popular afternoon program. His morning program, Billy Brown's Sunrise Club, was for the few that had to get up early in the morning. He gave out membership cards. You had to phone in to prove that you were up between 6.30 and 7 o'clock in the morning, and then he would mail you one of these cards and you were a member of the club. He would play George Formby and people like that, and rousing marches and English comedy and songs like Knees Up Mother Brown. He had a tremendous English family following, people that were from the old country, or blighty, as he would call it. Well, that was Billy Brown. Another uh, uh, personality that uh, I, I'm fascinated by is Uncle Billy Hassel, who had CHLS. And uh, it was a station that ran um, uh, music and variety and stuff like that. But really, in a way, I think he was using it to promote his interest in dog breeding and the sale of pet pro products, including a product called Dale's Doggy Dinner. And uh, uh, so there'd always be that aspect of the programming there. And, uh, I mentioned earlier John Avison. Uh, Avison worked on nearly all of the Vancouver stations at one time or another as an announcer, performer, and accompanist, and eventually became the founding conductor of the CBC Vancouver Radio Orchestra, which was a post he held until 1980. Yeah. Uh, he was also a distinguished composer. And I have a couple of uh, stories from him talking about his days working for Uncle Billy. <laughs> he says, CHLS was exactly at the identical station to the province-owned CKCD, in the same building, using the same studios, on the same frequency. It was called a phantom station. All the commercial programs were on CHLS. CKCD only entered the picture for the news from, early, from Earl Kelly, a very famous news announcer of the day. CHLS was operated by W.G. Hassel, who was known as Uncle Billy. He told dog stories, raised dogs, and sold dog food. My position at the station was music director for the sum of $25 a month, and on Saturday mornings I had to go around to various stores and count the cans of Dale's Doggy Dinner on the shelves as a kind of inventory. <laughs> uh, my job required so many things. You had to be the music director and play the piano for the singers. Uh, your programs were never timed, so that if you were short at the end of the program, the announcer would lie by saying that some dear old lady from White Rock had just phoned up and wanted George Boyd to sing the song that he had sung first on the program. In between times, I was leaping up on a chair. We had a German chiming clock on the wall, and I used to put the hands up to the chiming position on the hour. The chimes would ring out, and following that, I would leap back down to the microphone and say, Golden chimes measure the passing hours, courtesy of Shores Jewelers. Bill Buckingham was in a series called Marston of the Mounties. I used to announce that show, too. I also used to do the opening of the show, an imitation of horse's hooves, which I did by pounding on my chest. <laughs> that was a long-running series. I don't remember who wrote it. I don't think anybody would admit it. It was pretty dreary. Um, he's, he mentions about, about Billy Hassel. Describes him as a great, bluff, happy sort of fellow. He was a very forceful character, very convincing, and he became very popular with Vancouver audiences. The only thing is that sometimes, in the middle of a public broadcast from the Broadway theater, he would insist on telling stories about collie dogs with the idea of selling dogs and dog food. He also gave singing lessons in the studio in the daytime. I don't know what his background was vocally. We had a, quite a number of very young kids who were working on CHLS, primarily because they were free and Hassel was careful with a buck. <laughs> <laughs> um, how many of these were, have you ever actually been able to hear? Very few, especially in the period uh, 20s and 30s, there just wasn't a lot of recording made. The stations were, most of their broadcasting was live, and they just didn't bother to make a record. Uh, you have some recordings that you're using for this exhibit that you got from us from a collection, the, the Will Reader collection. And those recordings only exist because you could buy amateur disc cutting outfits. So, excuse me, that you could record uh, before people had tape recorders, you could record things at home uh, on disc. And Will Reader was a recording enthusiast and radio enthusiast who was also in radio broadcasting himself. And much of what we know about early Vancouver broadcasting survives because Will Reader recorded it on his little disc recorder. It, it just really strikes me with, with the book 
how fortunate it was that people thought to go and record the stories mm -hmm. of those people in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and, and get their information looking back. But it, it is tragic that so little of the material that they're talking about um, actually exists. Just It just kind of speaks to how fragile the oral record can really be. That's right. And we can imagine or speculate on how it sounded. Uh, and certainly, uh, everybody has an idea about how early radio sounded. Uh, I mean, I, I, I love the idea, but I still think that it must, it must have been pretty corny. Uh, <laughs> but I wish I could hear some of these, some of these shows. Yeah. I mean, to have it actually have a recording of Billy Hassel uh, hawking Dale's doggy dinner, that would be priceless. <laughs> It might be out there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm struck while doing the research for this exhibit how much material is online. And a lot of the American shows and a lot of big Canadian shows, um, there's a lot of, of uh, audio material online that we were able to download, commercials and radio dramas and variety shows and, and all of those kinds of things. So um, that's, a, that's the great thing about the web. It's For anybody who's an enthusiastic about an enthusiast about any subject there's the opportunity to go absolutely hog wild with your enthusiasm and put stuff on the air and I say uh, put stuff online and I say more power to you because uh, when we were when I was researching Imagine Please in the pre-internet days uh, it was very hard to find this stuff it meant you know sitting in front of, of a microfilm reader for days at a time trying to find uh, a little mention of a radio broadcast yeah yeah, yeah. No research has uh, research in our field has has definitely changed considerably. Now, I didn't find much in terms of variety shows or or dramas from the local area. Was there much of a radio drama um, thing happening in Vancouver? Vancouver had a very prominent role in the development of Canadian radio drama. Um, again, in connection with uh, with CNRV, but. Uh, I don't know what it is about Vancouver. It's always attracted people who are interested in culture. They had uh, amateur operatic societies, amateur drama societies going back before the turn of the century. Uh, but in June of 1925, we know that CKCD broadcast a program of musical and dramatic selections put together by a local acting and singing teacher named Arthur J. Foxhall. In July, he'd organized a company called Foxhall's National Players, and they produced two radio plays for CKCD, Nothing But the Truth and Peg of My Heart. In 1926, CNRV, the CNR station, rebroadcast uh, uh, that production of Peg of My Heart, and this time it was presented by Jack Gilmore, who was a member of Foxhall's company. And that seems to have caught on, and, and uh, it was just the right time for something like this. Gilmore organized the CNRV players in 1927. As a matter of fact, a wonderful picture of the CNRV players that you're also using as a poster for your exhibit. Uh, and it would present live drama broadcasts on CNRV every two weeks for the next four and a half years. And this was the first regularly scheduled radio drama series on Canadian radio. Um, it was heard locally. It went regularly to the uh, Western network and often to the national network as well. So people were hearing drama from Vancouver uh, before the 20s were out. And that was sort of that sort of set the stage, so to speak, for for what would follow. That Vancouver, when the CBC came along, Vancouver became a major center for drama production, uh, often under the noted producer Andrew Allen, who really created the CBC radio drama. During the 1940s, many Canadian actors and playwrights gained national exposure through radio plays that originated at CBC Vancouver. Another important figure was the young Vancouver dramatist Fletcher Markle, just a, a young guy of, I think, 21 or 22, who wrote, produced, and acted in the anthology series Imagine, Please, which my book takes its name from. It ran for 65 episodes on CKWX, which was a commercial station. So the fact that it wasn't just the CBC, commercial, uh, commercial stations were doing original drama. Uh, a matter of another big source of drama was CJAT in Trail. And they did uh, an ongoing series of um, mysteries and thrillers for the radio called Chains of Circumstance. And that was very popular. 
and uh, it went from trail to the network as well. And that's something that, unfortunately, I think we've lost. I think uh, one thing that almost every interviewer, interviewee told me was that the great thing about radio that you, was that you didn't have to see everything, that the, the scene would be painted for you in words, and you had to imagine what things looked like. And that was a, a, a different dimension in radio drama. Uh, you could have uh, a sword fight on a cliff with a castle in the background, and you didn't have to show any of those things. I'm very nostalgic for that. Uh, I, I, we have a, a small collection of, of radio drama scripts, and I'd love to, to do something like that again. Yeah. Well, we'd love to maybe produce some of them here. <laughs> That'd be cool. <laughs> um, so before we wrap up the interview, I was wondering if anyone in our studio audience might have a question for Dennis. Hi, Camille. Hi, do I count as the studio audience? Absolutely. So I was wondering, actually, how you got into um, studying about radio history in, in our part of the world. And was... Well, I, uh, I had gone through a communications program at Camosun College in Victoria, and I did some of my coursework at the archives. And I, was, I just was very lucky. Those were the days where if they needed something done, they could just hire you. And I did, I did a lot of contract work for them. They had the series... Uh, sound heritage, and I was originally uh, contracted to write uh, an oral history of the Okanagan Valley, and then I did one on early aviation, which was basically a rewrite job, and then this collection of radio material came in, and, and uh, the boss, Derek Reimer, said, how would you like to write this? And I said, okay. At, at the time, I, I knew a little bit about early radio as just sort of a, as a communication student would, but uh, it was just the right place at the right time. Sort of stumbled in. Right, right. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's, that's been my career, basically, stumbling in things. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time, Dennis. It's been great to, uh, to connect with you and have you here in the studio today. Thank you very much for having me.